Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Have the Indian and Chinese foreign ministers achieved a significant measure of understanding in Moscow? And as a result, are we one step closer to a possible peaceful resolution of the crisis in Qatar? Those are two key issues I shall raise today with India's former foreign secretary and former ambassador to China, Nirupama Rao. Mrs. Rao, let's start with the joint press statement issued by the two foreign ministers in Moscow. Both sides have agreed to abide by all existing agreements and protocols and border troops will continue their dialogue and quickly disengage and maintain proper distance. How do you view this outcome and in particular the fact that this is a joint statement? I think the fact, thank you Karen first of all for inviting me back on your show. Uh, as far as the joint press statement between uh, our EAM and the Chinese foreign minister is concerned. The first point I'd like to make is that it is definitely a positive development that we have a joint press statement. Uh, if you recall the previous um, uh, issues when they were discussed soon after Galvan, uh, I'm citing those instances, you didn't have this joint expression of intent or direction of the sort that you have seen today. So each side had issued their own statements, spoken in their own voices. But here you have, from Moscow, you have a joint press statement. So that's the first point. The second point is that this meeting lasted for, I believe, two hours. So what the EAM, Dr. Jayashankar, said a few days ago, as uh, that we needed to have deep discussions, both India and China, and the impression he gave was that this is going to be quite a long haul. There are no instant panaceas to resolving this situation. But the fact that a diplomatic and now political level contact has resumed, I think that in itself is a salutary uh, development. So we have to take note of that. And if you read the joint statement, um, while they have reiterated that differences should not become disputes, and that the current situation on the border is not in the interest of either side. They've also added that both sides would abide by the existing arrangements and protocols on China-India boundary affairs. And I presume they're referring to the mechanisms for, and protocols for maintaining peace and tranquility and confidence building, which had been in place since 1993. They were not exactly broke in that sense, as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, it doesn't need fixing. But something went wrong uh, in you know cascade of events that we saw along the line of actual control. And they are obviously looking at how they can set this right. Let's at this moment look a little in detail at the readout issued by the Chinese. I noticed that it doesn't blame India for provoking or creating the crisis. And that's very different to the stand taken by the Chinese defense minister just five or six days ago. In your eyes, how significant is this difference? Well, it's uh, certainly noteworthy. We have to um, take note of it, the fact that they haven't uh, been apportioning blame and talking about rights and wrongs. But um, this statement, this readout from the Chinese side, and I'm looking at it now, uh, it is quite uh, realistic. It talks about differences between these two neighboring countries, that you need to put these differences in a proper context. And um, right now, we need cooperation, not confrontation. I mean, there are lots of anodyne sort of expressions of how we need to deal with this, whether they will define the situation as it goes forward or whether we will see a reversal to this kind of blame mongering that we've seen. I noticed that even the Indian side gave a background briefing to various uh, press outlets after uh, the meeting. And there is still that uh, lingering impression that one gets that uh, while we would like a return to the status quo, uh, the fact that both sides, the troops of both sides are in a situation... Can I stop you there? I, 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 let's focus for a moment a little longer on the Chinese readout. We can broaden and talk about other things thereafter. Let's take it one by one. There's another sentence or two in the Chinese readout that struck me. I'm going to quote it. It says, it is also important to move back all personnel and equipment that have trespassed. 
the frontier troops must quickly disengage so that the situation may de-escalate. Now here the language is open-ended. It could apply to both sides rather than just India. Again, is that significant? Well, I would invite your attention to the sentence just before the sentence you read out. And it says that Wang outlined China's stern, and the emphasis here is on stern, position on the situation in the border areas, emphasizing that the imperative and the use of the word imperative, it's almost like a demand, is to immediately stop provocations such as firing and other dangerous actions that violate the commitments made by the two sides. Now, who is he talking of here? Which side is he talking of? Obviously, he's trying to but point a finger at the Indian side. Except the interesting thing, Mrs. Rao, is that the Chinese in their reader could easily have been specific and said, it is the Indian side that's been provoking, it is the Indian side that needs to behave. That finger pointing isn't there. Once again, I note the language in that sentence, the use of the word stern, the use of the word imperative. But the interesting thing is the language again is open-ended. That sentence which you read could equally apply to both sides. The Chinese have not made it India specific. And that's why I say that whole paragraph, the sentence you read out as well as the two that I read out are open-ended. And is that not significant or am I seeing too much significance into it? I think that's a very generous interpretation, Karan, of uh, the Chinese phraseology as we see it in this uh, statement. Um, I would like to be uh, more grounded in terms of uh, what we've seen coming out from the Chinese side over the last uh, two months or so. So the emphasis on words like stern and imperative would suggest that there is still this basic outlook that the Chinese seem to possess about who did right and who did wrong as far as the cascade of events that you saw on the line of actual control. I may be bordering on the pessimistic, but, but I would like to be realistic about this. So the problem hasn't really gone away. But I would add that two hours of discussions, deep discussions between the two foreign ministers are in itself a salutary development. And I'm sure they've had okay. very candid, very frank and forthright exchanges of views on the dilemmas that we face. In that case, in the light of the hesitation and reservation that you felt, let me raise two other very different concerns. First, the commitment to de-escalate seems very similar to the understanding that was reached between the core commanders in early June. But as you know, it was rapidly overtaken and breached by what happened at Galwan and what's happened almost regularly thereafter. So how long lasting is this understanding reached in Moscow? Might it not be equally easily breached as the understanding reached between the core commanders in June? Well, the situation is very fluid. There's no doubt about that, Karan. It remains tense. There are pockets of close military confrontation. Uh, I would, however, uh, in the light of all that has happened, including this, this, this latest round of discussions, I would rule out a black swan event like Galwan. I am willing to, uh, you know, stick my neck out on that. I believe the experience at Galwan was instructional for both sides. And I'm quite sure that while they may, may not be a return to the status quo that we've all spoken about, the status quo prevailing in April, caution will prevail on both sides. And I do not believe that either side will abandon positions just because of winter being around the corner, because everybody talks about winter being around the corner and how are we going to provision troops uh, to withstand you know, these extreme uh, range of temperatures that, you know, the, the high altitude terrain in Ladakh and in the Aksai Chin would subject a military personnel to. But let me add, I, there's no, uh, I don't think we need to kind of lose hope as far as India is concerned, because our troops particularly are quite well conditioned to these climatic uh, situations. You don't forget they're in Siachen through can the can year. Can 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 let's, let, let's keep our focus on what the two foreign ministers achieve rather than broaden out and talk about how well equipped or how well trained our troops are. 
There's a second that's a situation that the conditions are connected, you know. There's, there's a second bit of caution that I want to raise with you. I notice that there is nothing either in the Chinese readout and certainly not in the joint statement that talks about restoring the status quo to what existed in April. That was India's main demand, but it doesn't feature either in the joint statement or in the Chinese readout. And frankly, it doesn't seem to also feature in the briefing our ministry gave our journalists. It's simply missing from all three. Does that concern you? I'm sure that we would like a return to the status quo as it prevailed in April. The fact that it hasn't been mentioned uh, or that dog did not bark uh, doesn't uh, suggest to me at least that we have abandoned that requirement that we have stressed all along. Uh, you know, in diplomatic uh, statements of this sort, um, even as we read between the lines, uh, what is left unsaid is as important as what is said. So I think we have to keep that within our range of vision. I'm sure return to the status quo is important for us. Uh, but I think the primary challenge that we face now is how are we going to reduce and mitigate situations of close confrontation so that we don't have instances of firing, so that we don't have a steep esca escalation or a steep descent, let me say, into armed conflict. But on this issue of returning to the status quo, do you feel that that is actually something the Chinese haven't discussed and are nowhere near conceding? And therefore, this remains a major stumbling block. I'm sure this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, it hasn't been sort of aired in public. Obviously, uh, these are sensitive matters and... Uh, until the matter, until the situation is satisfactorily resolved, I'm sure both countries would like to keep the discussions confidential. Okay. And while they're working out the parameters of what this, what the range of the de-escalation and disengagement will be. Then in the light of all that we've discussed, let's look at the situation that prevails in the dark as of today. On Monday, for the first time in 45 years, we had shooting on the LAC and then today's Hindu, that's Friday, the 11th Hindu suggests that in fact the shooting may have occurred a whole week earlier than we even found out that has been happening several times. How worrying a deterioration was that? Well, firing is always a, a matter of concern, especially since it, it changes the situation. It introduces factors into the situation which are laden with risk existentially for troops on both sides and also is going to cast a long shadow on the discussions that are ongoing to reduce the confrontation in the areas along the line of actual control. So um, it, it is a little murky at the moment uh, what exactly happened. Uh, both sides, I'm sure, uh, would like to attribute responsibility to the other side. We really don't know what really led to this alleged uh, happening uh, of firing in the area's concern. So I'd really not like to comment too much on it. Obviously, situations of this sort need to be, to be avoided. Okay. But let me also add that um, we have to be prepared. We, this is a situation of very close confrontation. And uh, we have to be prepared for situations like this. Well, in which case, let me ask you this. How confident are you that after the two foreign ministers have met and they've come up with this joint statement, this sort of firing won't happen again? Because if it does, isn't there a danger that this time, instead of firing in the air, they could fire at each other? And since Indian troops have now been authorized to fire back, the situation could easily escalate. Well, you can't rule that out, Karan. But again, uh, since we were talking about the joint press statement, uh, the point number five in the five-point consensus that everybody says was reached at this meeting reads as follows. It says the ministers agreed that as the situation eases, the two sides should expedite work to conclude new confidence-building measures to maintain and enhance peace and tranquility in the border area. So I'd like to invite your attention to this. And obviously, they're trying to work out, I would call it a management regime uh, for a situation which is very tense and confrontational. 
And would that new management regime take into account the possibility of future firings, be they in the air or, or whatever sort they may be? Do you think that's a subject that this new confidence regime will specifically tackle? Well, yes, uh, to deal with contingencies of this sort, obviously this will have to be examined in detail and, uh, you know, a proper approach uh, devised, identified, that can then form a part of these new confidence building measures. But to that, I would supplement and, and underscore the importance of the discussions that are ongoing at the level of core commanders and at the, at the level of senior military uh, leaders. Now, one other problem is that on the one hand, we've had this significant meeting, a joint statement, which is of some significance because it is a joint statement, and an agreement to find a way of de-escalating and diminishing the troop contact. But at the same time, all the newspaper reports suggest that there's a huge, if not massive, buildup of troops by both sides. I mean, the Hindustan Times says there are 6,000 Chinese troops on the south bank of Pangong. The Hindu says there's a massive buildup of Chinese on the north bank of Pangong. The Economic Times says there are 50,000 Chinese troops and 150 fighter aircraft within striking distance of the LAC. And of course, it goes without saying that there is an equivalent Indian buildup, both of forces, equipment, and aircraft on the Indian side. Now, de-escalating from this level of buildup is neither going to be easy nor swift. So even though there's some understanding to talk and work towards it, there are a lot of pitfalls that lie ahead over which they could stumble. Well, I'm sure that uh, de-escalation can happen. Uh, despite, you know, all that you have just referred to about the amassment of troops on both sides. I think uh, it's obvious that both sides are strengthening positions. I, I do not deny that. They're both preparing, I'm sure, for various contingencies. But how much of this is also a mind game? How much of this is a power play? I mean, it's to be expected that in a situation of close military confrontation, where every each party, let me add, is determined not to give up ground. This is a situation that one could have foreseen. It's not, uh, should not come as a surprise. But on the other hand, in order to balance that, let me also say, and it's very important to introduce that element of balance. There's too much of this, uh, what shall I say, uh, the spectacle that um, we are trying to create in the public arena about, you know, as if, you know, this is, uh, Ladakh has been converted into Troy. I mean, that is really not how I see it. The channels of communication remain open. And last yesterday's meeting, I think, is a very sanguinary development. So both at the military and diplomatic and now at the political levels, these channels remain open and that's a positive element. So let's also focus on the efforts that are ongoing to introduce that confidence building that I just yes. referred to in my earlier... You very colorfully put it when you said the dark has not become Troy. But let me draw your attention to a second development that was in the papers just two days ago on the 9th, this time the Hindustan Times, and ask you, how much does that worry you? Apparently, Indian intelligence sources have told the Hindustan Times that the incursions that happened in Ladakh have happened at least in four other places along the 3,488-kilometer-long LAC. According to the Hindustan Times, there were two incursions in July in Arunachal Pradesh, one of which almost ended up to 40 kilometers into Indian territory. Then there was a third incursion in Sikkim in early August and a fourth in Uttarakhand in mid-August. Now, if these reports, I imagine deliberately given by intelligence sources to the Hindustan Times are true, doesn't it suggest that the problem is not just located in the dark, it stretches across the LAC? Well, I cannot really comment on these incursions that you referred to because there's, I have no means to verify this and I've not spoken to anybody in government to check with them about these incursions. But uh, on the basis of my experience and uh, my, my dealing with subjects of this sort uh, for, all, for over three decades uh, while I was in service, incursions of this sort that you just referred to have occurred from time to time in various pockets along the line of actual control or the international border. Uh, however, 
you, whatever way you refer to it. But I believe that the epicenter, the epicenter of tension will be Ladakh. And that is where the attention must be focused. And may I add, you just said about Ladakh and Troy, the reference I made. Why I said it? Because if you remember in 1962, where, you know, our troops fought so bravely in Ladakh, and that is an instructional lesson for the Chinese also. Whatever may have happened in, you know, our, um, the eastern sector, in the western sector, our troops were the bravest of the brave. And, okay. and Razangla, the Battle of Razangla, in fact, General, uh, I remember General Reiner telling me that it was our Thermopylae. Again, a Greek reference. Now, let's come back with this as the background and i deliberately went into the background in some details so the audience has a sense of not just the concerns but also the elements of hope and reassurance but now let's go back to that meeting that happened yesterday in moscow clearly the two foreign ministers were meeting at a very tense and fraught time perhaps not since 1962 has the relationship been so fraught and difficult as a former foreign secretary and a former ambassador to China, how difficult a meeting would this have been? I'm sure it was a difficult meeting. Uh, it was a challenging meeting. Uh, but it was a meeting that I'm sure both sides must have been well prepared for and gone into with their eyes fully open. I don't believe there would have been surprises. I don't th believe there would have been ambushes. And I'm sure each side must have uh, been in a position to discuss issues in depth and uh, at least identify solutions as we move forward. You must remember, these are not just talks. These are not just meetings. They are supposed to be negotiations. And negotiations by their very nature are long drawn out, especially when it comes to problems and challenges of this nature. So don't expect this to be just the be all and end all of, of a meeting uh, in that sense of the word. This is to be continued, as they say. One other thought. This meeting lasted two hours when it came up with a joint statement and the joint statement has five very specific points to make. Do you get the feeling that actually there's been a fair amount of back room contact between the two governments before the meeting happened, that the foreign office diplomats have been talking and working out, which is why at the end of two hours, they were able to come up with a joint statement. There was a lot of preparatory work, which we, the public, did not know about. I'm sure there must have been preparatory work uh, for such a meeting. I'm sure our, the foreign secretary uh, on our side must have been involved. I'm sure our ambassador in Beijing must have been kept fully in the picture. There must have been exchanges of communications. There must have been meetings at uh, junior levels. And don't forget the working mechanism for coordination and consultation on border affairs has been meeting regularly. So there must have been a whole body of uh, discussion that we must have built up over the last uh, eight weeks or so. And that must have been fed into uh, the discussions at this meeting also. So, yes, I agree with you. We were not going into this just, you know, it was not, not just a chance meeting. It was a meeting that must have been very well prepared for. One other thing, just days before he went to Moscow, our foreign minister said that the two countries, and I'm quoting him now, need a very, very deep conversation at a political level. Does that also suggest that this meeting, though important, is only the beginning of a whole process? Many more are needed before you can arrive at that point to mention point five of the joint statement, a new mechanism for handling the problem in the future. That could very well be uh, the case, Karan. I'm sure there are more meetings uh, uh, to be had in the future. You can't rule that out. And I'm talking at the political level. And uh, just this week, we had the meetings of the two defense ministers and then followed by the meeting of the two foreign ministers. I'm sure there are going to be more in the future. And, uh, and I'm sure every opportunity will be availed. Let's say there is a multilateral meeting. There is a group meeting of the SCO and our ministers present there and the Chinese counterpart, his Chinese counterpart is also present. I'm sure the opportunity will be availed 
had discussions. So it's a good thing that, that these contacts continue. It's not like we have snapped or severed these contacts. But the interesting thing is there's a huge difference in the impression left behind after the defense ministers met just five, six days ago, and the impression left behind after the foreign ministers met last night. I mean, the defense ministers meeting seems to have been a failure. They talked at each other not to, they stuck by their positions, and the Chinese defense minister seemed to be wagging his finger and accusing India. One of the phrases was, not an inch of Chinese territory will be lost. Neither that tone, nor that language, nor that accusation or pointing a finger of India happened yesterday when the foreign ministers met. Isn't it rather remarkable that in five days, things have changed almost 180 degrees? Well, I think uh, the real focus should be on the meeting of the two foreign ministers. Uh, the defense ministers did meet and they did exchange views and I'm sure certain positions were held. <laughs> you know, defense establishments are expected to do that. But I wouldn't read uh, too much, uh, too many conclusions, in, as you have just drawn, that that meeting was a failure. I wouldn't say it was a failure. I wouldn't use an extreme uh, term like that. Uh, it was one of those developments uh, leading to discussions at the foreign minister level. It must have been factored into these discussions. But I don't think it was about fin finger wagging. Of course, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, has a long history of hostility towards India. There's no doubt about that. But I don't think the views of the PLA as expressed, as you say, in that meeting of the two defense ministers should be the underlining factor to describe the ongoing negotiations. Let me then ask you this. Do you really believe, after all that's happened over the last 20 weeks, that China will retreat and withdraw from all the Indian territories occupied and we can reestablish the status quo as it existed in April? Do you really believe that's possible? That is certainly an aspiration, I'm sure, on the Indian side. Uh, what the Chinese are saying, uh, you know, they are disputing some of the positions we have taken and the statements we have made. How are we going to be able to narrow the differences uh, that obviously exist between the two countries is really the challenge. How do we narrow, narrow these differences? How do, I, how do we create, as I said, that management regime? to deal with these tensions. I think that's really the challenge going forward. I don't believe we should have boilerplate reactions on either side. All, a time, at the time has gone for all that. I think we are faced with a situation, a near crisis situation, along the line of actual control. Obviously, we have to hold our ground. India has to hold our ground. And we have to support what the military is doing in this regard. The nation has to be behind them. Except but long term at this relationship with China, what is our strategy? What are the ways? What are the means? What are the ends? But there's one, there's one issue that we must as a nation ask ourselves. Is it possible that at the end of the day, with reluctance, India may have to grit its teeth and accept that in certain parts of Ladakh, the LAC has moved westwards? Because if the Chinese don't go back to the situation in April, which they show great reluctance to even want to talk about, and the Chinese build up just on their side of the LSC suggests they're there for keeps, then is it that we have to grit our teeth and accept that in some parts of Ladakh, the LAC has moved westwards to our disadvantage? Well, the Chinese are certainly trying to... Uh move the line of actual control in these pockets where we've seen this kind of confrontation. Otherwise, these tensions would not have occurred. I don't know if this is the time now for us to dissect how this could have happened. This so no, no, no. I'm not asking you to dissect how it happened at all. I'm not asking I, you to dissect how it happened. I'm asking you, do we realistically have to accept that we may not be able to fully establish the status quo as it existed in April. Is that something we need to be aware of and conscious of? We have to be conscious of the fact that the Chinese have tried to move the line. The Chinese ha may have all kinds of reasons for it, and I'm not going into it. 
but they have tried to move the line and that is a cause of very serious concern for india and india has obviously taken corresponding actions to maintain our positions and to perhaps improve our uh, dominance in in some some areas so this kind of criss crossing but this is up this is up the question is a slightly different one not only have the chinese tried to move the lac they have in several places the lac is now encroached upon what we believe is indian territory they've occupied it whether we're talking about pangong north whether we're talking about debsan hot springs gogra it's happened all over and i'm asking a simple question can we get them to go back that is really what the ongoing effort is all about it may involve and if they have to go back Uh, it there will have to be some give and take on both sides that's what negotiations are all about uh, we will obviously have to be uh, we'll have to look at the ground situation we'll have to see how best we can deescalate the tension we'll have to see whether we can achieve a proper disengagement of troops from both sides without um, prejudice to the positions that we are taking i don't believe india would like to prejudice the positions we have taken on the line of actual control whatever solution is worked out but the immediate focus has obviously been uh, obviously have to be will obviously have to be a reduction of tensions it may involve disengagement from both sides so you may have for instance Uh, now in the finger area of pangong so for instance between finger 8 and finger 4 where you know the problems have arisen how are you going to deescalate in these areas are you is there going to be a situation okay, where this is out this is out yeah. i'm interrupting you because you said a very critical thing when you said there may have to be give and take on both sides and then you went on to talk about how we disengage and you mentioned finger 4 and finger 8 we believe all the territory between 4 and 8 is indian but the chinese are already at four occupying 8 kilometers of our territory now if both sides have to disengage the chinese may go back to six we would go back to two but these are that entire disengagement or buffer zone would be on indian territory we would have lost the ability to access and patrol what is ours that's what i'm asking do we now have to accept that when there is deescalation the end will be that india may not be able to access the full reach of its claim as they did previously karan i'm uh, you know i'm not talking of giving up sovereignty i'm not talking of a loss of territorial integrity all that is not part of these discussions at all when you have a situation of close confrontation of the sort we have seen in these areas in ladakh how are you going to deal with it how are you going to see that the troops of both sides are not placed in such a situation of close confrontation can you identify certain pockets you may call them zones of confront where confrontation has happened once you've identified them how are you going to create that management regime that i said in order to ensure that we do not have these kinds of confrontation leading into a descent into conflict absolutely witness that's what but, i'm saying but, but, i'm not talking about prejudicing our national no, no. interest absolutely whatever territory we don't have access to will still be territory we claim and still assert theoretically our sovereignty over just as we claim the whole of our side chain and our map is india but if we no longer have access and no longer can patrol to a point which we did have access to and did patrol up to in april then we have suffered a reverse because suddenly we can't patrol as far as we did and that's what i'm saying could it be that at the end of the day the lac will have moved westwards because no longer can we patrol all the way to finger 8 now we'll have to accept our end point is finger 4 even if our claim goes all the way to 8 that's the point i'm asking I think your prognostications are moving far ahead of uh, situations on the ground so I'm I will not go into them okay. all I can say, all I can say is that in any negotiation in any negotiation of this sort uh, there will have to be some concept of realistic appreciation from both sides about emphasizing that the bottom line is to uh, is 
to see that confrontation of the sort like we saw in Galvan is avoided. And secondly, that we create that regime of de-escalation and disengagement that identifies certain zones along the LAC where, you know, obviously okay. the line has been moving, where, as you said, westward because of Chinese action. I don't know how they interpret our actions. Obviously, <laughs> there is a whole story there. But we'll have to see, you know, how we can make the, take the steps necessary to de-escalate the situation. Yeah. Now, we don't, I don't have, let me add, we don't have to see it as a reversal. We don't have to proclaim defeat. We don't have to say we've lost our case. I'm reminded of what Hans Morganto once said to an Indian IR specialist, that India is the one country that even if we have won a case in an international court with, at the same time, as part of the judgment, having to concede perhaps 5 or 10%, India is the one country that will proclaim that we have lost the case. That's right. not how I, I, I hear what you say, your words, well, we don't have to see it as a reversal, we don't have to proclaim defeat. You also spoke about the need for some concept of realistic appreciation. But the interesting thing is the example you cited was Galwan. And let me point out to you that practically every Indian analyst has said that at Galwan, the buffer is on Indian territory. And as the business standard and several other papers have thereafter pointed out, at Galwan, the LAC has moved one kilometer westwards into Indian territory. If the resolution of Galwan is the sort of realism, we will end up with a solution, but it will be at the cost of not being able to access the full reach of our claim. But let's not quarrel about that. I was just pointing that out that Galwan actually is a very interesting example. It actually is perhaps one reason why you said, don't see it as a reversal, don't proclaim defeat. I'll come to my last issue because it's one that intrigues people. What do you make of the role that Russia played in bringing India and China together? What's your sense of the role Moscow played and Lavrov played in particular? Mr. Lavrov is, uh, is a champion diplomat. I'm a great fan of his, let me say that. I think the Russians are trying to be conciliatory to both sides without taking sides, overtly at least. That's my first point. The second point is that mutual trust between India and Russia has always been a very positive factor in the relationship that India and Russia share. And that continues. So obviously there's a comfort level about dealing with Russia and entrusting Russia uh, when it comes to be, um, it comes uh, to be a, 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 I would say a neutral party uh, when it comes to the problems between India and China, despite the closeness that exists between Russia and China today. I think the Russians, from what I've heard them say, understand that India and China have to ultimately resolve these problems. And it's, this is our problems in bilateral relations. They will take time. These negotiations will be protracted. I think they understand that. And um, I don't believe diplomacy is about leaning on another third party shoulder. I think Russia understands that. And the challenge is ours and ours alone, India's and China's. Let me put this to you, and it's my last question. Did the Russians play some sort of mediatory role without that word mediation ever being used? Or is this just Russian good offices because they are close to both countries and also because everything was happening in Moscow? Yes, everything was happening in Moscow. That's true. And uh, they, the Russians, in a sense, afforded us the space India and China to discuss the problem. But let me underline and underscore, I do not, I do not believe that they played a mediatory role. Not even by that lunch that preceded the Wang Jai Shankar meeting, many people felt that that lunch was very cleverly timed. It ensured a moment for the two foreign ministers to meet, perhaps get over some of their friction perhaps get into a better mood for their joint meeting that followed. Was that a carefully, deliberately timed lunch? I think the Russians were doing a little matchmaking perhaps, but not mediation. Ah, well, that's beautifully put. Russians were doing matchmaking. 
I applaud you on your beautiful turn of phrase. Ladakh is not Troy. That is one that I think would intrigue the audience. And I think this final concept is the ideal moment to end the interview. The Russians were doing matchmaking. Thank you, Karan. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Stay safe. You too. Stay safe. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.